Hi, everybody, and welcome to this episode of Snooze TV. We're so very excited to have you join us today. We're sorry we're getting started a couple of minutes late today. We had a little bit of a minor technical difficulty, but we have all of that, um, all of those issues resolved now. My name is Jennifer Beard, and I'm with the Hypersomnia Foundation, and I just want to welcome you to episode number three of Snooze TV. Tonight's episode is all about narcolepsy and narcolepsy advocacy. And we're so excited about the guest panel members that we have tonight for tonight's discussion. And so we're going to go ahead and get started by talking a little bit about how the audience can participate because we want the show to be really interactive and we want you guys to be able to put your questions to our guest panel live on the air. And we're going to pull your questions onto the screen and give the guest panel members the opportunity to answer those questions for you live. And that's what makes this show really cool and really interactive. So in order to be able to do that, I have some tips for the audience that I'm going to share. And let's see if I can do a, a screen share. A screen. Nope, let me try again. Let me try again. Here we go. Okay, can you see my screen? Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. So I have five tips for the audience members. And the first tip is to keep your questions succinct. We can only see so many characters on our screen. And so in order for us to be able to um, see your question and be able to read it out loud on the air and answer it, please keep um, limit your characters so that we can kind of see your whole question. Please keep your questions general. None of us are physicians on the panel this evening. We certainly can't give you specific medical advice that's specific to your situation. So please don't put us in that situation. Just ask some general questions that might be of general interest to audience members tonight. You also want to pose questions that you think would be helpful for the audience. So you might know the answer to it, but if you think it would be helpful for us to discuss the answer to your question during the show, then definitely feel free to make that comment. We love to hear comments from you too, so if you're enjoying the show or um, if something that one of our panelists says resonates with you, please let us know that. And your question or comment may appear on screen, so be aware of that. Let me go ahead and stop sharing my screen now. Let's see. Are we back? So the way that you're going to post questions to our guest panel members is simply by typing in a comment underneath um, the video box window that you see us in right now. So if you're on our Google Plus page, you'll just type in a comment and um, click post and we'll be able to pull your question on, uh, on the screen. Or if you're watching us on our YouTube channel, you'll be able to post a comment underneath the video box there as well. If you happen to be watching us on our website at www.hypersomniafoundation.org, um, that's fine. You can certainly sit back and relax and watch the show there, but you won't be able to pose your questions there to us live. What you'll have to do is scroll down to the bottom of our website, and at the very bottom of our website, you'll see our social media icons. You can feel free to click on our YouTube icon or on our Google Plus icon and go watch the show on either of those pages and post your comments underneath the video chat box there so that we can see your question live on the air. So hopefully that helps. Um, I just want to remind you that this show airs live the second Friday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and we discuss a variety of sleep-related topics. And so with all of that said, I am so excited to introduce to you tonight our wonderful guest panel members. So, Michael, if you don't mind white boxing them as I introduce them, we're going to talk about Monica first. <laughs> That's not Monica. <laughs> Let me try again. <laughs> okay. So this is Monica Gao. She's the co-founder and executive director of Wake Up Narcolepsy, which is an advocacy organization dedicated to funding narcolepsy research and increasing awareness to reduce the diagnosis time. 
Monica is the mother of three teenagers, the oldest of whom has narcolepsy, and she lives in Massachusetts and has dedicated her life to improving the lives of people with narcolepsy. Welcome to the show, Monica. We're very happy to have you. Okay, next up uh, is Jessica Davenport from Project Sleep. Jessica is the fitness and wellness specialist for PSCU. PSCU is the nation's leading credit union services organization. She has her bachelor's degree in wellness leadership from USF. She is an ACE certified personal trainer, a well coaches certified health coach. She is extremely passionate about creating awareness for sleep health and sleep disorders mostly because she knows what it's like to be a sleepy person herself. In 2006, Jessica was diagnosed with sleep apnea, and then in 2010, she was diagnosed with narcolepsy without cataplexy. In 2015, in conjunction with Project Sleep, she hosted the very first Sleepwalk Tampa Bay event. Now she currently volunteers as the Director of Sleep Education Strategies for Project Sleep. So welcome, Jessica. I can't wait Thank to hear you. about... Um, about your sleepwalk that you did in Tampa Bay. So welcome to Thank the show. Good to have you here. Okay, we also have uh, Molly Einan. She is from the Stanford Center for Narcolepsy. And Molly developed narcolepsy with cataplexy at age 22. Although excessive daytime sleepiness or EDS was present, it was her rather severe cataplexy that caused her to seek care. Molly was fortunate as she was diagnosed on her first doctor's visit within a couple of months of first developing symptoms. Molly was later a study subject in narcolepsy research at Stanford near the time of the discovery of the loss of hypocretin as the cause of classic narcolepsy cataplexy. In a funny twist of fate, Molly has worked at the Stanford Center for Narcolepsy as the clinical coordinator for the last 14 years. She has worked in numerous other volunteer positions, helping in roles of support for people with narcolepsy throughout the years. Welcome, Molly. We appreciate you being here on the show with us tonight. Thank you. We also have Melissa Patterson, who is representing the Narcolepsy Network. And Melissa was diagnosed with narcolepsy in her freshman year of high school and attended her first Narcolepsy Network conference the following year. She has completed her master's degree in public policy in 2013, and she now works for Narcolepsy Network as their outreach coordinator. Melissa is especially interested in working with youth, and she has helped expand Narcolepsy Network's resources for teenagers and young adults. And back with us again this week, we're very happy. Oh, thank you. Welcome to the show, Melissa. We are so excited to have you here tonight. And then back with us again, we have uh, Michael Starace, our wonderful and fabulous technical producer. He wasn't able to be with us last week because he was busy um, closing on a house, so we're very happy to have him back this week. And you won't be able to see him because he doesn't have a webcam, but this is his picture. And Michael Starace is a product management analyst for Home Depot. He received his Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy at Clemson University and began his career working for Clemson University's Master of Public Administration program. This led to an exciting opportunity working as CTO for an education technology startup in Virginia. After Michael met his wife Deidre, he began looking for a position here in the Atlanta area where he currently resides and works. Michael became interested in the Hypersomnia Foundation after his wife, recently diagnosed with idiopathic hypersomnia, attended the 2014 Hypersomnia Conference. He has a background in web development, data analysis, tech support, and distance education. And Michael is here tonight to make sure we don't have too many technical difficulties. So thank you, Michael, for being here with us again. And we also, jumping in at the last minute, thank you so much, Kate, for, for stepping up and jumping in for us. We have Kate Murray. She is another one of the board members here at the Hypersomnia Foundation. And she's here just to help us out with some of the diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy. And then um, she will be hopping out and uh, probably watching the show <laughs> from, from her home. So thank you, Kate, for jumping in at the last minute. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everybody, for being here. So I wanted to um, throw the first question out to Molly. 
Um, and I thought it would be good, guys, if we just go over the diagnostic criteria for narcolepsy first and foremost so that uh, we all kind of know what we're talking about. And so, Molly, I wonder if you'd be willing to share with us the diagnostic criteria that you have available for narcolepsy. Did we want to let Kate go first so she can hop off sooner to do the DSM criteria, or do you want me to start with the ICD-9? Sure, let's have Kate do the, the criteria on her side first, if that's okay with you, Kate. Sure is. Yes. Um, the diagnostic criteria I am reading are from the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, and it is under sleep-wake disorders. And the criteria are recurrent periods of irrepressible need to sleep, lapsing into sleep, or napping occurring within the same day. These must have been occurring at least three times per week over the past three months. That is, not, that is A. And B comes in three parts. And you need only one of the three to have a diagnosis of cataplexy. They do not differentiate between the different forms except that you specify in the coding what, what the um, subtype is. So to have a diagnosis, you either have episodes of cataplexy, hypocretin deficiency, or the findings on nighttime polysomnography showing rapid eye movement or REM sleep latency, and that obviously meaning the time that it takes until you go into REM sleep that is less than or equal to 15 minutes, or on a multiple sleep latency test, you have a sleep latency of eight minutes or less and two or more sleep onset REM periods. And those are, yeah, that's the, those are the criteria according to the DSM-5. Thank you, Kate, for sharing the DSM-5 criteria with us. We appreciate it. And, and I'll we, jump um, off and watch. <laughs> thank you for joining us, Kate. <laughs> Okay, so Molly, that was the DSM-5 criteria. What criteria will you be sharing with us, and, and how is it different than what Kate shared with us? Well, it's the ICD-9 codes, and this is the newest version, and they, they have um, separated out narcolepsy with cataplexy separate from narcolepsy without cataplexy, and they've actually renamed them because of the confusion. So. Now, what they call narcolepsy type 1 is um, the following. So that is hypocrite, or the alternate names to narcolepsy type 1 are hypocretin deficiency syndrome, narcolepsy cataplexy, or narcolepsy with cataplexy. And both criteria A and B must be met. Criteria A is the patient has daily periods of irrepressible need to sleep or daytime lapses into sleep occurring for at least three months. And then criteria B has two, um, and, and either one or both of the following points under B must be met. And criteria number one under B is cataplexy, and as, defi as defined, and we can go over some of the definitions, and a mean sleep latency of less than eight minutes and two or more REM sleep onset periods on an MSLT according to standard techniques, and a SOREM within 15 minutes of sleep onset on the preceding nocturnal polysomnogram may replace one of the SOREMs on the MSLT. So that's based on some more recent research where they found it's very rare for people to go into REM in the first 10 or 15 minutes of a nighttime sleep study um, unless you have narcolepsy. So sometimes it does happen. Um, occasionally in people who don't have narcolepsy, but that finding is rather new, but it's actually more rare to go into REM on a nighttime study than it is to go into REM on those napping tests. And then the second point underneath B is CSF hypocretin levels that are less than 110 or one-third of the mean values obtained in normal subjects with the same standardized assay. And I can just say from my experience here, kind of a normal mean level of hypocretin in people who don't have anything wrong in, in controls is about 350, and that's where that level of 110 or below comes from. 
And then there is the second criteria, and, and, and there is more um, elaborate descriptions of these different things that if, if people have specific questions that we can go over. And then the second diagnosis is now called narcolepsy type 2, and the alternative name for that is narcolepsy without cataplexy. And the diagnostic criteria for this, both criteria A and E must be met. So there's, there's a longer list of criteria. So A, so A is the patient has daily periodation, daily periods of sleep, or daytime lapses into sleep occurring for at least three months. B, a mean sleep latency of less than eight minutes and two or more sleep onset REM periods are found in the MSLT. A so REM on the preceding nocturnal polysomnogram may replace one of the so REMs on the MSLT. So, for example, if somebody went into REM on the nighttime study in the first 10 or 15 minutes, but only went into REM on one of the naps, that too would meet the criteria. Um, C, cataplexy is absent. D, either CSF hypocretin has not been measured or CSF co concentration is greater than 110 or greater than that one-third mean value of, of what's found in normal subjects. And E, the hypersomnolence or MSLT findings are not better explained by other causes such as insufficient sleep, obstructive sleep apnea, delayed sleep phase disorder or the effect of medication or substances or their can influence that. So all of those criteria A through E must be met to meet that narcolepsy type 2 diagnosis. And that's it. Great. Thank you for sharing that with us, Molly. Good grief. That's such a lot of information to take in and it seems like such a complicated process for diagnoses. But I think one of the key points that I just took away from that is that it can't be caused by some other other means. So if it's a medication that's making me sleepy or if I'm, you know, sleeping four hours a night and working way more than I should be um, and that's what's causing my sleepiness, then, um, you know, the criteria would not fit somebody like, like me, for instance, if that were the case. We have a shout out for you, Molly. <laughs> Ruth, let me see if I can pull your comment up here. So uh, Ruth says, if Molly is the clinical coordinator at Stanford, I might have spoken with her a few months ago. She referred my husband to Emory due to his idiopathic hypersomnia symptoms, and that was so helpful. <laughs> and it's nice to see your kind face. What a sweet thing to say, Ruth. How sweet. And Ruth is also saying, um, Jessica, that she uh, saw mention of your sleepwalk on Twitter the other day, and she's interested in hearing more about that event. So thank you for your comments, Ruth. Keep them coming, everybody. We um, appreciate uh, our audience interacting with us, and we will certainly be talking a lot more about um, about the wonderful things that these organizations are, are out there doing for the community as we go along through the show. Um, so I, I kind of want to jump in now that we've defined what narcolepsy is, and I want to talk a little bit, uh, for those of you who have narcolepsy, you know, what is it that you want people to understand about living with narcolepsy? So just an average person that, that's out there that may or may not know very much about narcolepsy, very much about narcolepsy, what do you want to take away from, take away from, from uh, the, oh, I'm getting a little bit oh, of an, I'm getting a little bit of an, so I'm going to go ahead and mute so my, go ahead and mute myself, and um, maybe and, just um, maybe start with you. Just help start with you. Absolutely. So Absolutely. if so, someone's been recently diagnosed with narcolepsy, I would really want them to know to reach out to any and or all of the organizations that are out here and, and are a part of this call tonight um, to not feel alone. So one of our big campaigns with Project Sleep that Julie Flygar, the founder, um, started was the Narcolepsy Not Alone Project. And that was, again, to reach out because medications, diagnosis, it can be overwhelming. Um, I often said for me personally that being diagnosed was just the first step. Um, after that came several years of up and downs of trials of medications and different things 
and it was only through connecting um, at that time with people through um, the internet, through the different blogs and social networks, because um, I had never met another person uh, in, I say, in real life uh, uh, with narcolepsy. So I really feel like for anyone that's been diagnosed and, and to reach out, whatever it is, um, connect with another person that has narcolepsy um, because that can really help tremendously. That social support sometimes can help um, almost just as much as some of the medications because you know, this is a chronic lifelong um, disorder, so having someone that can understand um, what you're going through is very, very important. So I, I, I definitely say reach out, get connected, and, and be a part. Thanks, Jessica. Molly, um, do you want to chime in and, and maybe, you know, tell the audience and the community what you would like uh, people to know about what it's like living with narcolepsy? I've lived with narcolepsy now for a very long time. Um, it's almost hard to remember what living without narcolepsy was like. Um, but I would say one of the things that I've found in addition to you know medications for the treatment is that the more consistent I can be in kind of implementing healthy habits in my life helps make managing the symptoms better. So medications help, the healthy lifestyle habits help, help but I still have my, my symptoms of, of narcolepsy really are never completely gone, but I will say it's much easier to manage when, when I'm able to, now that I'm on the best medications that control most of my symptoms and able to implement, you know, eating right, going to bed at consistent times, waking up at consistent times, um, taking naps. Naps are sometimes the best medicine for people with narcolepsy where that's not always true in um, idiopathic hypersomnia. So, um, so for me, I would say one of the best hint is take a nap before the nap takes you. Would be one, one of my mottos. Oh, I like that little motto. That's great. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Melissa, um, let me, let's see, if you can unmute yourself, and I wonder if you would be comfortable talking about what you think people you, uh, would under, should understand about being a dark Sure. Um, for me, one of the things that the general public should understand is that narcolepsy isn't just falling asleep in your soup or you know, falling down because of cataplexy, it's also the brain fog, it's also the little micro-sleeps, the automatic behavior because your brain's asleep but the body's awake. Um, and so there's all of that that goes along with it. Also, I'd echo what Jessica said at Project Sleep said, that for someone who's been diagnosed with narcolepsy, you're not alone and it's so helpful to have people who have been there and done that. It's I see a lot in our community of people trying to re reinventing the wheel um, because it's a rare condition so maybe no one in your community, your physical community, geographic community has it. But we're out here on the internet and one of the really powerful things that Narcolepsy Network does is our conference because for so many people that's the first time they've ever met anyone with narcolepsy aside from themselves. And that is such a powerful and life-changing experience, and it's something that I feel very strongly is one of the greatest strengths of, um, of my organization, because it gives people a chance to network and communicate and um, solidarity. Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> Sorry, I was <laughs> muted. Thank you so much for, Thank for you sharing that. Time. Monica, I wonder if you would be willing to um, share from a parent point of view what you see your child going through, because I think that's such a valuable perspective to, to share with the community as well. So as a parent, what do you want people to understand about um, a child who lives with narcolepsy? Well, um First of all, for my son, I know for not everyone, but for my son, it is very invisible. So the struggles he has and, um, you know, just everything he has to go through to make it to school, to do, to do the whatever activities he wants to be involved in is, is really difficult. 
um, so many behind the scene type of things. However, he is really determined and driven. But I, I know, you know, he's had narcolepsy now for seven years. And um, every, it's not every year, but it just, it seems like a process. And I think parents, when their children are diagnosed, it's just, it's almost like they have to have patience and figure out what medications work and just just be patient that um, things will improve once they find the right medication and they do have to advocate for their children and they have to find the right fit um, of the neurologist or whichever doctor is treating their child. I just think that that's very key. Um, and just support the child and help them learn to self-advocate you know through school and, and finding somebody on the inside of the school systems that can help um, and really just, you know, pushing for your child and not stopping, at not letting anything stop you, I think. That's probably key in a nice way. So can we talk about school just for another second? Um, has anyone on the panel um, needed accommodations that they had to formally request in their school? Um, or Monica, as a parent, do you have to ask for accommodation for the child? So I just yeah. want to yeah. yeah. Um Yeah, as a student, um I was lucky enough to have really great teachers the year I was diagnosed, um, who cut me a lot of slack and uh put a lot of classroom supports in place, but in the end my mom did uh and moms are so important. Um as Monica said, keep fighting and don't stop. Uh, but she did have to formally request accommodations. Um, I was unmedicated at that point, and I had very bad disrupted nighttime sleep. Um, so even once I started the stimulant medications, uh, I was still horribly sleep deprived, which is um, awful if you're doing school. So extra time on tests and quizzes, uh, adjusting the due dates so that not all the assignments coming due fell on top of one another. Um, and the point Monica made about finding someone in the school system who is sort of behind the scenes and has your back is very important. Um, I had a really good guidance counselor my ninth grade year. In fact, the only really good guidance counselor I had in my entire school career was that year. So you have to think there is some serendipity there. Uh, and um, just finding that ally within the school system is very important. Mm -hmm. One yes. thing I'd like to say is that due to the nature of, of the sleepiness of narcolepsy, I think going to school is the most difficult thing to do um, because so many of the school activities are, are fairly passive. It's listening to a lecture, it's reading a, a chapter, it's watching a movie. So um, one thing I admire, I mean we see tons of kids here at Stanford and I've got to say I just always am so impressed on how tough these kids are and how I know it's so much harder and they they I think they're working two and three times harder than everybody else but um, I, the one thing I always tell young people and tell parents is it does get easier as you get older because life has is more flexible and, and your schedule is more your own even going to college I think for some is easier than high school because they can schedule their classes around the times that work and and, and schedule a nap time in where that's not always as possible um, as somebody who writes accommodations for uh, most of the, for, for many kids who have narcolepsy, that most kids don't want a whole lot of accommodations, but probably the most important accommodations for the kids who do the best in, in school is taking that nap in the middle of the day. And so sometimes as people with narcolepsy, we need to learn to give ourselves permission to do that. So even though I was older and really grateful to have you know, finish school before I developed narcolepsy. Later on, it was I had to learn to give myself permission to take those naps. I was always worried that somebody might think I wasn't pulling my own weight or might judge me in some way. But it was my own ego that got in the way. And once once I was accepting of that and allowed myself to take a nap, it really helped me be better at everything that I did because you know it was it was important to my doing well. 
you know, I think the naps, yeah. um, I think the kids who do take a nap do tend to, to do better, but there are many of them who don't want to take a nap, and, and that's their prerogative. Right. Well. I agree. Can I jump in for a second? I just wanted to jump in and say, especially with um, our teenagers, and again, I wasn't diagnosed till I was, uh, let's see, um, five years ago after my son was born. So I can ima can't even imagine being a teenager and having you know to go through this because so I have a 16 year old stepdaughter, and she's phenomenal, um, and she's in honors classes and doing these things and. Certainly what we know now is our teen generation, they are the most sleep deprived. Um, I think there's huge awareness and, and it's really being worked on now to raise awareness for our teens that are so sleep deprived again from a lot of different things, the timings of schools and things like that. But my daughter Gabby will tell me how uh, she sees people sleeping all the time in classes. <laughs> and who knows, I think, who knows, maybe they're just sleep deprived. Some of them may have narcolepsy. We don't even know because they're so sleep deprived. But um, I, I liked what, um, and forgive me, I'm not sure who mentioned it earlier, but a couple of things. It's invisible. It's so hard. Um, no one can look at someone with a sleep disorder, you know, narcolepsy or hypersomnia and know because we look fine on the outside. And like you mentioned, giving permission. So uh, a quote um, we've been talking about recently at Project Sleep was, you know, sleepiness is not laziness. And I have to remind myself of that so often too, that giving myself permission to take that nap uh, that at work that they won't look differently or um, in they're very supportive. But so if you are a teenager and you're trying to get ahead and get great grades and get into school and you're pushing, 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 you know, you don't want people to think you're lazy. But if you're sleepy, you've got to take that break. You've got to take care of your body. Right. And Jennifer, can I just add one thing too regarding the accommodations? Please. Um, Absolutely. Just uh, not to forget about the, you know, the standardized testing accommodations with the SATs and the ACTs. And I'm sure Molly, you know, handles the um, accommodation requests on those. But we have had, um, you know, the ACT accommodations rejected and have had to resubmit. So just, you know, not give up on those as well either. And, um, and then I think the accommodations changed probably slightly when going into college. Just you know, being able to request to request the the your your exam. Um, sorry, your um, classes sorry, your be classes one of the first ones to one indicate one. the classes. Priority scheduling. And priority scheduling. Yep. And, priority yep. scheduling. and also yeah. the um, accommodations um, regarding regarding housing. Housing. Um, depending if somebody's going to be going to be living alone in a dorm or will they be. You know, having roommates. I don't know. That's those are the things that we're thinking about now. Since my son will be entering college next year. And I can speak to some of those having been through college with um, with narcolepsy. If that's um, anything someone would be interested in. Sorry, I was muted Sorry, again. Was yes, again. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Um, in terms of college, one of the big things is deciding roommate or no roommate. Personally, I'm in favor of um, having a single room, but then having uh, roommates who share a bathroom or a common room with you. So they're called suite mates instead of roommates, because that's someone who is sort of a built-in social, so social option, particularly for a freshman year. I mean, even if you have the... Um, most awful roommates or sweet mate experience ever. That too is a social bonding experience. You talk to other people and say, oh my gosh, my roommate is so awful and their boyfriend is this hairy thing that lives on the floor of our dorm and it's awful. So that can be a bonding experience as well. Um, and it is also a support system. So for example, we had fire drills. Um, and we also had fire drills caused by people burning the popcorn in the microwave. <laughs> I was exempt from the actual fire drills. Uh, we talked with campus safety, and that's something you definitely need to do, particularly if your child is on Xyrum. Um, talk to campus safety, explain that they aren't going to be as responsive at night and that they're going to be very groggy and unable to respond in an emergency so that campus safety knows they're there. Um, my parents arranged for me to have first floor uh, accommodations so that in the event of emergency, it was very easy to get in and out. Um, but 
your suite mates are important or roommates can be important for those times when it's not a planned drill. It's the popcorn or the cheesy toast or the microwave mashed potatoes catching on fire. Um, so that's when they can say, no, no, we can smell burning popcorn, you stay in bed, it's not an emergency. Or get you out if that worst case scenario comes to pass. Um, they're also good for the, if you oversleep your alarm, which I will uh, cop to doing once or twice. Um, so they can be a good support system, but you really do want to get campus safety or housing, um, however that's handled on your campus, on your side, uh, to handle some of those issues associated with it. And also for medications, um, lock them up. Don't tell people about them. Don't tell your roommate about it if you can help it. Lock the medications up. Um, a lot of people with narcolepsy take some of the ADHD drugs and I I was not hanging out with people who were using a lot of performance enhancing drugs, but I was offered my own medication without a prescription multiple times when I was on campus. And obviously I had no need for it and did not seek it out. So if you do seek it out, it is there and you don't want your kid's medication to become a casualty of that. So lock it up, get a safe, get a lockbox. It's a great point. A great point. Yeah, these are all really, really yeah, good tips really you guys are sharing. It's going to help a lot of families out there. Thank you so much. Appreciate that. Um, so one thing that I want to talk about are some common myths that you all, or people with narcolepsy in general, confront on a daily basis, and and myths that you have to dispel about the um, the disease, the sleep disorder. And I I want to try something where we open this up to our audience members as well. Audience members. If you're out there and you can think of a common myth about narcolepsy um, that you would like to confront or dispel, if you could just type that into the comment box and we'll pull some of your myths up on screen while some of our guest panelists are talking about it. And I think Jess, I think it was Jessica who um, shared one earlier, sleepiness is not laziness. And I think right. that that's not really true about the narcolepsy community, but that sort of is, is kind of a pervasive and overall um, thing even with idiopathic hypersomnia and some of the other sleep disorders um, that are out there in the community. So sleepiness is not laziness, I think, is a good one. But are there other myths um, that need to be confronted and dispelled about narcolepsy? Anybody want to jump in? Well, I like what um, uh, Melissa said earlier about not falling asleep in your soup. Um, I mean, that's what we, whenever... I tell somebody they have I have narcolepsy they're like oh does that mean you're gonna just fall asleep right in front of me in a few minutes and I say no um, but that's probably one of the most common and to really make people understand that again in my case um, well I like to say with narcolepsy you know every case is unique um, it took me even a long time to understand that I have narcolepsy. My narcolepsy is very different than somebody who has narcolepsy with cataplexy. It's a spectrum. So um, the the biggest things for me are, are a lot of cognitive things, uh, memory, especially short-term memory. Um, and when I get really tired, um, that uh, say even my colleagues, my my family that knows me, they can tell when I've reached that point where I'm starting to feel sleepy because I'm just not, you know, not with it, not focused as much. So. Um, one of the biggest things too is realizing it's so many of those little cognitive things that just focus, um, you know, productivity, different things like that. So again, you know, the reality for me is I'm not going to fall asleep in front of you and it's not a joke. I think cataplexy is largely misunderstood as well. Um, I think that many people think that cataplexy is somebody falling asleep and that sometimes that, um, joke of the falling asleep in your soup is a misunderstanding what cataplexy is and even um, in a lot of the TV specials that have been done that describe narcolepsy with cataplexy, when they describe cataplexy they, they kind of describe it as falling asleep and for somebody who used to have a whole lot of cataplexy, it's, it's the antithesis of that. It's when I was most engaged and most enjoying myself that I would have cataplexy and I feel that you know, when people are fighting cataplexy, they're using the energy of 
lifting trucks over their head to fight the cataplexy. It is not sub, sub, you know, submitting to some sleepiness just suddenly, but that, that's really largely mis, misunderstood. And it, it feels like even a lot of sleep doctors don't understand cataplexy as well as they could. Yeah, I um I saw a YouTube video that a young lady posted recently. I don't know if you guys have have seen it, but I thought it was so incredibly brave of her. She was filming herself um, doing some Japanese dance, and as it turned out, she had some micro sleeps and some cataplexy episodes, and she posted it on YouTube to try to help dispel some of those myths. And I thought that was incredibly brave of her, and a very very powerful. Uh, video um, to put out there on on social media so I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to see that but thank you Molly for sharing that and um, interestingly we have a lot of comments from our audience members coming in right now so I'm going to pop a couple of those up on the screen so Sloan says um, you don't have narcolepsy if you don't fall asleep mid-sentence or if you don't fall asleep while walking or while eating etc so um, yeah, I think that that's definitely um, a myth. And we have another one from Anne here who says that people with narcolepsy cannot drive. Um, so does anybody want to speak to that about driving and having narcolepsy? Well, I have been driving and since before I developed narcolepsy and I've never ever had a car accident and I treat it with a great deal of respect. It's not my strength or strong suit. I'm not the person um, who wants a long commute or is volunteering to drive here and there, so I avoid it as much as possible because it isn't a strength of mine. But if anybody at any time had ever said, oh, and by the way, you can't drive a single mother with narcolepsy who's trying to work and support your daughter, um, it would have been, it would have made my life even harder. So I felt that I feel still after all these years that I've really demonstrated that I've treated it with a great deal of respect. I've never had a car accident, but it is something that I don't chose to do a lot of. And I, I would say that um, going back to, well, last summer yeah. when um, summer, the Honda right came out with their commercial um, about the Honda Fit and uh, made a joke about it. It was only up for a little while, but that um, Basically, the the whole thing was this gentleman. There was this, the fit was this new um, Honda car, and it was lots of cute little segments in it. And there just happened to be somebody that kind of pretended like they were falling asleep. And the person said, "Well, you really shouldn't be driving anyway." And oh boy, did that cause a storm from the narcolepsy community? Because if you have narcolepsy, it is not a joke, um, and we take driving very, very seriously. Um, and so, to I mean, to maintain your driver's license. Um, but thankfully, I think something that was negative um, actually turned into a really big positive when Honda decided to do a public service announcement um, that kind of came through the whole um, narcolepsy community, and and then put those public service announcements out there to really say what narcolepsy is. So yes, we take driving very seriously and people can drive and I think people with narcolepsy even um, go much further to ensure that they are safe drivers than I'd say some of the uh, millions of sleepy drivers that we have out there. Um, so Ruth um, so posted Ruth a comment. Let's see. And she, she says, yeah, I saw that too. I think, Ruth, you're talking about the, the YouTube video um, where the young lady uh, posted um, bravely about having cataplexy. Thank you. I'm not the only one who saw that video. So thank yeah, you for posting, posting that comment. And then we have another question. Let me scroll back down here um, from Jane. She's asking, on average, how long does it take to receive a diagnosis of narcolepsy? So does anybody have a, a thought about that? I know that's kind of a tough, tough question to answer. Well, the last I, I don't think the last statistics are very good. So the last are very good. So the last paper that that paper documented it was done. You know, I think it was published in the late 70s, early 80s, and at that time the number was 14 years. Um, I, 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 it'd be interesting if somebody could do a large scale you know, good study. I would say what I see in the sleep clinic here at Stanford, and maybe it's, maybe we're unique at Stanford, but I would say we see a lot of people within the first year of developing 
symptoms. Um, and even if we don't see them until two or three years later, they are getting diagnosed accurately with narcolepsy fairly rapidly. I would say within a year or two or probably like Melissa's experience. But what we're finding oftentimes is they often don't get on the right medications until years later. So that even though somebody has finally figured it out and sent them to a sleep doctor and they get the sleep diagnosis, let's say a year, but when you're a young one, a year is a very long time. But then it may Uh oh, did we lose Molly? Did we lose her? Maybe we'll come back to Molly in just a second. Um, we have a couple more questions from our audience members. Garrett says, I was diagnosed with narcolepsy without cataplexy about a year ago, and one of the challenges seems to be finding out exactly how it affects me. And then um, we also have a comment from Beth who wonders if, it, if there's a possibility of a genetic connection between family members. And woo, we're getting a lot of comments. Um, and then another question from Beth about medications. Um, for people uh, who have narcolepsy without cataplexy and idiopathic hypersomnia, and are they the same and are people responding in a similar fashion to those? So I don't know that we can address that particular question because none of us are medical professionals on, on the show tonight, um, but is there any information about a possible genetic connection? Do we know about that at all? Anyone on the panel? Well, Molly would be the better person to answer this question, I think, but uh, there is a genetic component um, in that there's a marker, a gene marker for it, and um, it's unfortunately one that's shared by a large part of the population, so there's both environmental and genetic components um, to the condition. Um, so you can have the genetic marker and not have narcolepsy, um, but it's very rare for you to have narcolepsy and not have the genetic marker, although I do know a couple of people who don't have that marker and do have narcolepsy. Thanks, Melissa, for sharing that. Um, I, we're actually coming to the end of our time here pretty soon, so I just want to switch gears for a few minutes and um, let's talk um, about some advocacy stuff and things, wonderful things that your organizations are doing. Um, so how did Sleepy Saturday go for everybody last weekend? So I just wanted to start with that question. Um, what, what did we do or focus on for Sleepy Saturday as far as our organizations are, are, are uh, focused on? Focused on? Um, so Monica, can we start Monica, with, with you on that? Sure. sure. We, we, actually we actually had a yeah. narcolepsy awareness campaign running um, for the entire national sleep week last week beginning on rare disease day and it was um, focused on social media campaign and then traditional media in Michigan which is where one of our board members is and Massachusetts and we did have a, a wide reach and um, felt as though it was a successful campaign we shared a lot you know what wake up narcolepsy we had a little icon of a clock an alarm clock and we um, shared alarming facts every day about narcolepsy and then we also asked people to take um, alarmed face selfies and post them on the social media and tag people and we were able to reach um, one of the public figures with narcolepsy and she um, which was great because she has a much larger reach um, her name is Ginger Z and she's the meteorologist on the Good Morning America show so and our final, you know, we kind of wrapped up um, giving a tiny little spiel on outside of the Good Morning America show. Um, we wrapped up our sleep week with that. So we felt as though we had a successful campaign during sleep week to raise narcolepsy awareness. That's what we did. Well, that's, that's awesome, Monica. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Melissa, can you um, share with us a little bit about um, Sleepy Saturday from Narcolepsy Network's point of view? Did you guys do anything for Saturday? Sure. Yeah, we had a number of members request proclamations officially recognizing it as Suddenly Sleepy Saturday in their state. Um, I think, I know we had over 30. Um, 
Then we also had uh, the one I personally found most um, entertaining because I got to go and attend it, the narcolepsy bed race. Um, in Virginia, and that is an event in which uh, people raise awareness by getting a team together and racing a bed with wheels uh, on a course, and you're racing against the clock. Uh, we had a great turnout for that. Hundreds of people turned out for it, uh, news coverage um, and coverage in the local papers, so that was great. There's uh, fantastic photos of that online um, at WDBJ7. Uh, which is the Roanoke, Virginia uh, CBS affiliate. So if anyone wants to go check that out or at the narcolepsybedrace.org. Um, we also have um, a new informational video that we put out in uh, awareness, raising awareness for uh, Suddenly Sleepy Saturday. And you can find that on our website. And um, do you want to share with us what your website is, Melissa? Sure, uh, narcolepsynetwork.org. Oh, great. Um, Jessica, did we leave for a second? I'm sorry, what'd you say? Sorry, what'd you say? Oh, good, you're here. Do you want to tell us you about Sleep the Saturday for Project Sleep? Absolutely. Um, it was a fun day. It was a blast. Um, we actually had the very first sleep in event, so um, kind of uh, um, really it was it was international. So uh, Julie Flyer's um, headquarters are out in L.A. So we say we were L.A. to Tampa Bay um, hosting sleep ins. So basically, we were asking people to make peace with sleep. So um, instead of going out and doing things, staying home, um, we had lots of people make pledges um, for certain amounts of times that they were going to stay in bed and relax and make peace with sleep. And they made peace posters and uh, just you know had a great time um, here in Tampa Bay. Although we did get out, um, we had an event at a local park and had um, a sleep physician and a sleep technologist and lots of people came and we gave out information and we did uh, sleep in selfies in the park, um, set up a big bed and peace signs and just really to raise awareness and it was just a lot of fun. So. I think um, the idea that we all kind of need to make peace with sleep and that it's a good thing. So it was a lot of fun. Well, I know I certainly need to make peace with it because I have not yet recovered from spring forward. <laughs> this is always such a tough time of year for me, and, um, and I don't have a sleep disorder that I know of. So I can only imagine how tough it is on, on many members of our community. So I empathize with everybody out there in the community. Um, so let's talk about um, what's most challenging in the in your advocacy work with your organization. What do you find is the greatest challenge um, for your organization? So Monica, I'll um, I'll throw that one to you first. I mean, sorry, I, I think I, am you're I muted, muted, Monica. Okay, okay. You're I think Mike, Michael unmuted me. So. We, you know, started Wake Up Narcolepsy to raise money to support research, and the raising money part is the hardest for us, and it gets harder and harder every year. So right now we have our biggest um, fundraising campaign is the Boston Marathon team that we have, and this will be our sixth year of having a team of runners, and that is primarily, um, that's the, the largest chunk of money we receive for our um, to support researchers like Dr. Mignot and Dr. Scammell um, and a couple of others, um, Dr. Naranj in, uh, in Toronto at a, at a children's hospital up there. So basically that is um, our biggest challenge, raising money for a disease that is, you know, people on the outside see my son and it, he makes everything on the outside look so easy, but it's not and it's just because of that having being an invisible disease, it's just really, um, really tough. So that's our biggest challenge. Yeah, I think um, raising money is, is definitely a big challenge. So um, all you guys out there in the community watching this video, pick one organization that resonates with you and donate $5. <laughs> we exactly. need your help. 
Um, well, Melissa, do you want to share with us um, a challenge that your organization experiences and what that is? What that is? I think for us, since we're the largest and the oldest um, narcolepsy organization, uh, one of the big challenges we face is just making sure that everyone gets a voice. We're a large organization. We try and run things sim democratically um, in many ways because we feel that it's really important that all corners of um, the community do get a voice because we don't want to exclude anyone and we do want to make sure that the different needs of different communities are heard. Um, I know we have a number of people who um, have difficulty sometimes paying for their medication, so we want to make sure their voice is heard. We also have people who really that's not a concern, but they would very much like um, their high-powered law degree to get them jobs where they can actually take a nap at their desk, so they would like more employment. So trying to respond to all the needs of our very diverse and broad community and um, making sure that we give everyone a seat at the table. That's probably the biggest challenge for us as a, as a large organization with diverse membership. I think we had 500 people at the last conference, so. Wow, that's, that's wow, incredible. That's, that's wonderful. wonderful. Molly, um, from your point of view at the Stanford Center for Narcolepsy, what is uh, the biggest challenge that you all experience? Well, I would say related to fundraising. So, you know, every, you know, research takes money, but I would say also, given the number of people who have narcolepsy, the funding for NIH um, research is um, so minuscule in sleep disorders and narcolepsy in particular, and I would say even less funded for idiopathic hypersomnia and narcolepsy without cataplexy have even less funding. It's the money that can really help fund really big projects. They have um, fairly deep pockets, but it's not appreciated. So even, you know, when, when the grants go up for review, they're being Did we lose Molly again? I think we may have. Michael, can you um, check in with her? And I'll go with um, to Jessica for a minute, and hopefully we can get Molly back in a minute. Sure. Um, Jessica, from Project Sleep's point of view, what is the biggest challenge that you guys experience? I would say right now, as being kind of a fairly younger um, nonprofit, um, that we have so many phenomenal projects that we're working on and we're very, very excited about. It's uh, just kind of taking our time, <laughs> trying not to get too ahead of ourselves and take on too much at once, um, making sure that we can do all the things that we'd like to do um, effectively. So we're just trying to take it a little bit at each time and really grow and, and, and have fun with the different projects that we're doing. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I don't see that Molly's back, so I'll try to make the point that she was making, that the National Institute of Health has fairly deep pockets, and they're the ones that really can fund some substantial research projects, and um, we really need them to look at, at sleep disorders a lot more and, and consider funding those projects. And um, hopefully that was the point that she was trying to, to get across to everybody. So if they're watching this YouTube video, help us out, would you? Help out the community. So I know that um, we're, we're running out of time, and I can't believe it. This hour has just flown by. So I just want to um, wrap up by giving you each the opportunity to talk about some project that your organization have that has that's up and coming that you really want to let the community know about. And also, if you wouldn't mind providing one tip um, to somebody out there in the community with narcolepsy or a family member or a loved one or a supporter of somebody, who has narcolepsy, what's one tip that you would offer um, to, to be helpful for, for those people? Um, so, Monica, I'll go to you first um, to talk about something that Wake Up Narcolepsy is working on and to give a tip. Okay, Jennifer, thank you. The major project we have right now is the Boston Marathon uh, fundraising team, and that is and a great opportunity for our runners to raise awareness and to raise funding. 
for research and that is April 20th and people can learn about that on our website wakeupnarcolepsy.org and one tip I would give to parents is um, what I've observed with my son is that he was not able to articulate how he felt on different medications so I would speak to other adults who had narcolepsy who were on the various medications and ask them what the side effects were and then I would go at, back and ask him do you feel this way or that way and, and that seemed to work okay for us and just really advocate, advocate, advocate. If, if you don't go with your gut as a parent, if you don't feel like your child is getting better, then see a different doctor. That type, you know, just don't stop until you feel like you have the best treatment and the best care and the best medications for your child. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, Melissa, do you want to talk about um, a project that Narcolepsy Network is uh, working on or has up and coming and offer a tip to people out in the community? Sure. Um, I know we have our New York City sleepwalk coming up. Um, and I don't have an exact date off the top of my head because I am not in New York City uh, and will not be able to attend it and I have an awful memory for dates. You can find it on our website, however, so if you want to look it up there, and that is um, coming up this spring. Uh, it would be on Suddenly Sleepy Saturday, but it gets too cold in New York. <laughs> so we also have our conference coming up in October, and I encourage anyone um, to attend if you think money might be a problem for flights, because I know those can get expensive. Um, it will be in Minneapolis this year, and you will be able to um, get uh, some help with your expenses, um, some of you, from the network, so you can apply for scholarships for the conference for that. Um, tips, I would go back to what I said uh, at the beginning of our um, conversation. You're not alone, and you're not the first one going through this, so by all means, reach out to someone in the community. Reach out to one of these organizations, um, Narcolepsy Network, a message board if you want to do things the old-fashioned internet way and I can't believe I'm saying that but uh, the uh, Facebook pages we have and um, on Twitter and uh, we now have a tumblr so we you can reach out to us in a variety of ways and we'd be happy to hook you up with someone um, who can help we have a new resource program that actually connects you with people who are um, experts in a particular area so if you're looking for help with school advocacy for your child we have people who have a lot of experience with that who've gone into schools and done that and if you're looking for help with um, your legal rights we have some help with that and we can connect you with people in your area as well so anyone who wants support who wants a solution reach out to the community Thanks, Melissa. Thanks, um, Jessica, I'm going to go to you next. So um, please share with us what exciting things Project Sleep might have up and coming and a tip that you might have, and then we'll go to Molly. Great, thank you. Um, we're really excited about the Project Sleep Seek Walks. Um, we just had one, I forgot to mention, actually on Sleepy Saturday, um, and that was in Austin. Um, but the rest of 2015, we have four more sleep walks happening. The next one is in Washington, D.C., um, and this will actually make, be, make our fifth year that we've been doing the sleep walks. Um, so that's really exciting. Uh, so this will be the, the fifth anniversary at the one in Washington, D.C. in April. And we'll also be having one in Dallas, uh, in Tampa Bay in September, um, associated with the Current Concepts in Sleep Conference, um, and then also one in Hawaii. So we're very excited about that. Um, and also, we, um, this is our second year of the Jack and Julie Narcolepsy Scholarship. Um, and that's actually the first scholarship just for students with narcolepsy. And this year, we're planning to give out four or five scholarships. So that's really exciting. Um, really just good stuff. So I would say, as a person with narcolepsy, um, that 
for people with narcolepsy to be patient with yourselves um, and also patient with others. There's so much misunderstanding out there um, and also sometimes for us as we're learning. I think I learn something new about sleep disorders and narcolepsy every day. Jokingly, I, I call myself a sleep geek now. So one of my favorite sleep doctors, Dr. Cologne, said that that was the cool uh, term. Not a sleep nerd, but a sleep geek. So that's my thing now. To be patient, to know that um, you know, take each day as it comes. We've got good days, we've got bad days, and, and that's okay. So take a breath and, and try again, and sometimes take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jessica. Um, and I just want to go to a comment really quickly um, from Ruth, who's asking if you could post the link to the New York Sleep event somewhere easy to find. And um, Ruth, maybe I could ask all of our guest panel members if I know you all have fabulous websites and wonderful, exciting things coming up. So if you would be willing to maybe post links to um, all of your various websites and events that you have coming up um, underneath our, our Google Plus page underneath this video so that people can um, go back and click on those links, that that would be really helpful for them. So um, Jessica and Melissa and, and Monica um, and Molly, I wonder if you guys might be willing to do that for uh, for people watching. Would that be okay? Okay, Absolutely. great. Absolutely, yes, of course. Thank you. Um, and then Molly, <laughs> I want to come back to you. Um, I know that we kind of lost you and you're muted, so if you want to unmute yourself there, Molly. Well, every time I speak, I get lost, so I feel like it's better for me to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> I think this is twi twi twice when I'm saying something, I lose connection. So. And what you were saying was so important about the NIH um, and research money, so I wonder if you might be willing to finish that point for us. Yeah, I would say, you know, as, as people don't always have money to give, but people can write letters, send emails, and urge that more dollars be dedicated to narcolepsy research. Idiopathic hypersomnia research has even less funding than narcolepsy, but we, we constantly find, I mean, we just had a grant that was just submitted and it didn't even make it to that stage where it got reviewed because I think the people that are reviewing don't have an interest. And so I think that, that somehow we need to make the vo voice heard that people are interested in more narcolepsy research being funded. And because it's a problem. Um, the number of people who have multiple sclerosis have narcolepsy, and yet the funding is a fraction of, of what other disorders with similar numbers of people have. And so it, it really is something that those letters and those efforts can, um, you know, really translate into millions of dollars for research. So it's certainly well worth, you know, the campaign. So all of you with the support organizations, I would encourage you to have, you know, help help create form letters so that people can send them in and, and, and make um, email addresses available. That's another way without having to, you know, dig into your pockets that you can help improve the, the money situation in narcolepsy. I think everyone can do that. Absolutely, absolutely. We have our marching orders from Molly, guys. So <laughs> I think all of us can uh, can join in to the to the crusade here and, and help out. Thank you so much. Is there anything, um, Molly, that you guys have coming up at the Stanford Center of Medicine that you wanted to share with the community? We wrap up. Uh, no, I mean we just continue to be very busy, um, and you know, and we've always. We're always working to collect more blood samples, spinal fluid samples, and brain donations. So, um, yeah, I, I, we continue to work in the area. Of we, we know, we've known now for a long time that hypocretin is missing in people with the narcolepsy with cataplexy. We also understand that there's a difference in the T cells or the immune cells in people who develop narcolepsy. And we're f further trying to hone in and identify what is that exact difference that causes this mistake of the immune system to happen. Once we figure all of that out, we actually will be able to prevent people from developing narcolepsy. Um, but what we need more work to be done in is how to, um, we need to get the drug companies working in the area of hypocretin replacement. and. That, too, is one of those things that if there's enough voices heard, that maybe the drug companies would take an interest in doing that. So, so the drug companies are looking at it now, um, finally. <laughs> but it's been you know, a good 10 years since that discovery was made that, that you know, 
that they haven't looked at it. So again, it's just I think if we keep doing what all of these great organizations are doing by creating awareness that that, that hopefully the voices will be heard and, and more more work will be done and more work will be funded. It's expensive. Drug development costs, you know, millions and millions of dollars. Thank you so much, Molly, for, for sharing that. And, you know, what you say is so very true. And hopefully as people, more and more people watch this video and attend the conferences and share, share, share and, and help to raise awareness um, that, you know, maybe with the power of all of our voices amplified together, we can, we can all work together to make that happen. Um, so, you know, that's kind of one of the goals of, of this show. And I'm so glad that you guys... We're all here for the show tonight. I just want to thank you all for, for joining us and fighting through the sleep to make it happen for everybody um, through all of our technical difficulties. <laughs> we do our very best, and boy, do we keep Michael busy. Michael, thank you so much for helping helping <laughs> us today make this, uh, this, um, this News TV event uh, a success. And I want to thank our audience members. Man, you guys were great tonight. You posted tons of questions. Sadly, we weren't able to get to all of your questions even tonight um, just due to time constraints, but we really thank you for your participation, and um, we'll encourage everybody to kind of go back and revisit the comments and see about posting responses to your questions after the show um, or, you know, over the weekend and next week as we have time. I also want to mention that all the Snooze TV episodes are archived on the Hypersomnia Foundation website at www.hypersomniafoundation.org. And um, as Melissa was saying, the Narcolepsy Network has an upcoming conference. The Hypersomnia Foundation also has an upcoming conference. Ours is going to be in July in Atlanta, Georgia. And for more information, you can find um, that on our website as well. And as I stated at the very beginning of the show, this show airs the second Friday of every month at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So the next episode will air on Friday, April 10th at 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. And uh, for everybody out there in the community, please remember, we're not going to take it lying down, and we will see you next time. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you.